let me begin this uh, series of talks on algorithmic sustainable design, the future of architectural theory. So let, let me begin the first lecture, recursion in the Fibonacci sequence, universal scaling, and biophilia. The point to begin is to explain the title of the lecture series, Algorithmic Design. What is algorithmic design? An algorithm is a set of instructions uh, that can be followed to achieve a desired result. The end result is not always predetermined. In mathematics, we have an algorithm for computing something that is predetermined. We go through a series of steps. It's an algorithm, and we compute what we want to compute. Uh, systems that are predetermined are like finding a sine of 35 degrees, a, a, a standard result. But when you go to complex systems like architecture, uh, there is no predetermined end result. You, you have an infinite number of different results, some of which have better qualities than others. So uh, an algorithm in that case is not a way to a unique result, but an algorithm cuts down the choices, and each successive state, uh, successive step of the of the algorithm gives you a state. So, for example, if you have an algorithm with several uh, steps, after the first step you cut down the the choices from one million to say 100,000, and the next step you cut the number of choices from 100,000 to 10,000, and so on. If your algorithm is good, <coughs> then you are. <coughs> comprehending the complexity of the problem and are, uh, and are um, reaching towards a desired result. And there could be many desired results, but may, by many, as um, Christopher Alexander points out in The Nature of Order, by many, they can be infinite. But suppose for, for, the, for the purpose of comparison, you can have uh, 10 good possible and results. So starting from a million to get down to 10, the algorithm is an efficient one. And um, uh, otherwise, uh, you will not be able to, to cut through all the complexity. Uh, and the, the key to an algorithm is that it breaks up the problem into smaller steps, eliminating uh, undesired complexity at each step. Uh, some of these algorithms uh, use uh, recursive feedback. Recursive means you do something. Uh, once and then the uh, the result of your action then can feed into the next step so that your algorithm is is uh, has some feedback that that uh, helps you in the direction uh, you want to go to achieve a an optimal result uh, this is to be contrasted with the conception of all at once all at once is is uh, uh, a tradition in architecture. The great architect conceives everything, finished uh, in his or her mind, and then writes it down, and, it get, and then it gets built. Well, uh, even the simplest building is, is a problem of such extraordinary complexity that that is not uh, very uh, viable. Now, I would like to suggest that we use algorithms to compute a result, and uh, we use algorithms to design. So I'm, I'm making the comparison between, between design and the computation. The end, of a of, of a, the end result of a design, a successful design, can be compared to the end result of a computation. If we don't have an algorithm, what do we do? We retrieve a result from memory. If you're forced to solve a problem, a mathematics problem, and you have no idea of how to solve it, you have no algorithm, uh, to solve the problem, then you guess. Now, what is guessing? Guessing is using intuition. And what is intuition? Intuition relies strongly on, on memory. So uh, memory of in architecture is a memory of typologies that one has experienced and one has uh, uh, learned and inputted. So when uh, you are faced with a problem, without realizing what you're doing, you are outputting memory so um, your exposure to different typologies will influence your solution, which, uh, and you mistakenly think that, that uh, such a solution is, uh, is totally innovative. It is not. What I'm suggesting, however, is that you can get 
out of uh, memory dependence by using an algorithm. And hence, you can become more creative. And of course, every architect wants to be more creative. Now, the other part of the title is uh, sustainable design. Uh, my meaning of sustainable uh, is slightly different from what is used today by uh, many architects. Uh, nature uses certain rules to create form, morphogenetic rules that uh, of all the natural uh, phenomena that we see around us, both animate and inanimate biological forms and physical forms. Uh, if we as human beings uh, think of architecture as an extension of biology, <coughs> because it is human beings uh, which are a biological phenomenon, creating structures to house themselves and their activities, then um, it makes sense for us to uh, follow the morphogenetic rules that nature herself follows. So this is the broader meaning of sustainable design. <coughs> In... Um, Traditional and vernacular architectures, uh, natural materials that are freely available have certain uh, limitations, structural limitations, and they actually constrain the build form to certain geometries. With uh, the uh, Industrial Revolution and the modernization, we have materials that are so strong and so powerful that we have no structural limitations at all uh, anymore. So uh, one constraint that kept... Um, the built environment to these sort of morphogenetic rules that were more natural has disappeared in the last century, and now we're free to, uh, to build any shape we want. But the results, therefore, uh, are free to be either uh, adaptive to, um, to human uh, sensibilities or totally violate human sensibilities, and uh, there is no check. Um, many people today claim to make uh, sustainable buildings by uh, using technology, like solar, pan solar panels. Well, that's a step in the right direction, but a technological fix does not connect to the intrinsic geometry of nature, and uh, philosophically, one is really getting away from the concept of sustainability the way my friends and I uh, understand it. Now, uh, I'll uh, begin the, the meat of the, of the lecture with uh, a recursion, an arithmetic recursion. A repeated operation with feedback. The Fibonacci sequence is uh, well known to most architects. We start with the number one, then we add the one, and then we take the two previous numbers and add them to get the next number. So in that way, I generate uh, the, the uh, sequence, one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, etc. And it's an infinite sequence. Continuing, I can uh, keep generating any uh, number in the sequence by adding the previous two, two numbers. There is a connection with the golden mean, which I will uh, um, uh, address later, but that does not concern us now. Well, after one page of, um, of work, I'm able now to present a, an important concept uh, for architecture, the universal scaling hierarchy. In the Fibonacci sequence, we have a very nice tool. If we take the alternate terms of the Fibonacci sequence, we can use them as a check for subdivisions in an adaptive design. So I have uh, taken every other term of the Fibonacci sequence that I showed earlier, and uh, I get what... Uh, um, what is now also an infinite sequence with the numbers 1, 3, 8, 21, 55, 144. And I propose to use these as a check for subdivisions in an adaptive design. For example, here is the method. Going up in scale, I will take the smallest built scale, which is determined by physiological constraints, say a step that I know has to be a certain height because of the size of human beings. So I propose that the next largest scale in a design should be about three times that step, the next largest scale about eight times that step, the next scale about 21 times that step, the next about 55 times. Uh, these are the uh, numbers of the sequence that, 
that I just uh, showed. And uh, I go up until I get to the size of the whole building. Now, this is not meant to be a, a straitjacket, that everything has to be exact, but it's, uh, it's meant to say that if a designer has uh, complete freedom in making an element of uh, his or her building in size, then they can use the, uh, the universal scaling that I have proposed to help in the design. Instead of wondering, should I make this uh, one meter or uh, five meters? Well, by checking the, the Fibonacci, uh, uh, the alternative terms of the Fibonacci sequence, that will give a hint as to what fits in the, in the scaling, and uh, that will make the building more harmonious. Now, it is our, our contention that it will make the building more harmonious, but uh, we will discuss that a little later. The design should try to avoid significant scales in between these approximate scales. So we all know of design which is too busy. There are too many things happening at many different scales, and we would like to avoid this effect is undesirable. So let me um, now uh, show a corollary application, starting from the largest uh, built scale, say the size of the building itself, or one of its main features, and going down in scale, I will use exactly the same numbers, and these, this time I will divide by those numbers to get, uh, to get the ratios. So the next smaller scale should be one-third of the largest dimension. The next smaller scale should be about one-eighth the largest dimension. The next should be about one over 21 of the largest dimensions, etc. And how far down do you go? Well, since the, uh, since the universal scaling... Uh, rule is an infinite sequence, we can go right down to microscopic sizes. Do you need to have all those scales precisely? Absolutely not. But this, again, this is a, a, a check for, um, for the relative sizes of elements that one uses in a design. And even more important, going down in scale means that you go down to one meter, uh, half a meter, 20 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 3 centimeters, 1 centimeter, half a centimeter. When is the last time that contemporary architects paid attention to elements on those, size, on those sizes? These are the human scales. And I'm afraid that with, um, with a technological style of, of building, we have not paid much attention or any attention at all to these human scales. So by using uh, universal scaling, I am, I am um, waiting in, uh, as far as uh, showing that they're equally important. The small scales uh, are in the same sequence as the large scales. So while we, uh, we pay attention to the height of a room, the height of a ceiling, we don't pay attention to the 10 centimeter scale. What's on the 10 centimeter scale? Well, the, the room I'm speaking in, where's the room I'm speaking in? Yes, the room I'm speaking in has nothing on the 10 centimeter scale. Uh, if I were in a more traditional building, there would certainly be something, small details, small trim, that uh, while uh, uh, such elements um, have been uh, have been um, ignored and, and not included in, uh, in much contemporary architecture. We see now that, from a mathematical point of view, they offer something to the design on on many different scales. So here is the golden rectangle that everyone knows. Uh, it has a ratio of the golden ratio 1 to 1.618. And uh, we are going to uh, subdivide it in order to get a square out of it. So I subdivide it so, so that I get a square. And what is left on the right-hand side is another golden rectangle. 
it is smaller, of course, but it, is, uh, it has a similar proportion, but it's standing up instead of lying down. In order to get a, a golden rectangle that's also lying down, I take one more cut and create a square. Square on top. And now I have uh, two uh, similar, self-similar golden rectangles uh, lying horizontally. I can continue this process indefinitely. And I get a whole bunch of uh, golden rectangles standing up and another set of golden rectangles lying on their sides, getting smaller and smaller. So I have, uh, I'm not interested in, in the rectangles per se. What I want to do is generate these lengths that I show. There is a, a set of um, horizontal lengths that are shown on top of the rectangle and a set of uh, vertical lengths that are shown on the, on the right. Well, th these lengths are, are important because of the relative ratios. The relative ratios of these lengths both the horizontal and the vertical are those numbers that I derived from you, I derived for you uh, just a few uh, slides ago. So uh, these are, this is how the numbers arise. And um, we can get a, a little better uh, visual idea of, 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 uh, of the relative uh, scales. Suppose uh, we have a, a building, we want uh, a subdivision, so we go to the next smaller length, we have that subdivision, and then the next smaller length will give us the, the subdivision of that building. Uh, each of the subdivisions that I'm talking about is, is normally not a single thing, it is, it is uh, usually uh, several uh, subdivisions or, or uh, tectonic elements at that particular length. So a little mathematics now to relate what I'm doing to the to the um, to what people know about the the golden ratio. If you take the limit of of the alternate terms of the Fibonacci sequence, as the terms get large, you get a fixed irrational number which is 2.618. Now one would say why uh, why go through all this uh, trouble of, of adding those numbers? Why don't we take powers of 2.618? Well. We cannot because uh, the Fibonacci sequence is not a geometric sequence. That means it is not uh, a sequence where you have a number a to the nth power because the way you get it is by, is by adding the last two terms. Anyway, these, these are mathematical details <coughs> that do not concern us. But for the uh, practicing architect, I propose the exponential sequence. So uh, everyone has a pocket calculator, and uh, each pocket calculator has the logarithmic constant e, which is approximately 2.72. Now, if you take powers, integral powers of e, then you get numbers that are approximately those numbers that come from the universal scaling sequence, as you, you can see from, uh, by comparing them. So if you are on the construction lot and you have your pocket calculator, you can do these uh, checks of the relative sizes uh, by using E. And of course, this is a, I may be um, ostracized by my mathematician colleagues. This is a very approximate. But since I'm talking about a, 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 uh, a constraint on design that is itself supposed to be approximate, it doesn't matter if these numbers are approximate or not. Uh, now, when you get to the high powers, say e to the tenth, and you look at the uh, corresponding term in the uh, in the universal scaling sequence, well, there is some difference, but uh, we don't worry about that. Uh, some graduate students have to write have, has to write a PhD thesis about uh, which is more correct, but uh, I'm not going to do that. Now, uh, e has uh, has an especial uh, interest. We know that. The, the Fibonacci sequence has um, has a uh, uh, let's switch here. Yes, the, the Fibonacci sequence has a long history and application uh, to uh, the growth of sunflower seed uh, spirals and the growth of leaves, etc. So, what I'm talking about does have a direct relation to the way uh, plants grow and, and uh, uh, natural forms, biomorph biomorphogenic processes. Uh, little e also does, because uh, little e determines the, the shape of animal shells, uh, uh, horns of mammals, 
and, uh, and mollusks and all sorts of interesting things that uh, are, uh, well, of, of side interest to architects. But uh, for this lecture, it serves just to point out that there is a connection with uh, natural, natural forms. Now, the universal scaling hierarchy extends the old rule of three used in the past. In many architectural rules of thumb, the master architect would say, well, if you want something on a bigger scale, you multiply by three, or if you want to subdivide it, you divide it by three. That's the old rule of three. Well, what we have done is to give the other terms. And uh, there's a certain uh, pleasure in mathematics when you take a result that's been around for uh, millennia, and you say, well, this is incomplete. There are, in fact, more terms than the number three, and the other terms are the ones I have given you. So there's a certain um, uh, intellectual satisfaction of this. So I have, uh, uh, I give many more arguments in my book, A Theory of Architecture, chapters two and three, and uh, the person who really got into this is uh, Christopher Alexander in The Nature of Order. Uh, especially in book one. For those of you who don't know, my work is intimately related to uh, Christopher Alexander's work because I helped him to edit The Nature of Order over 25 years. So um, what I write in my books, of course, I have, I have learned from uh, Christopher, and I, have, I, I hope to have made a few uh, uh, independent discoveries here and there. But uh, um, our work should not be... Um, uh, my work should not be taken to be uh, independent of his. Here is uh, the cover of uh, Christopher's book, The Phenomenon of Life, is volume one. It's where he discusses the uh, scaling and boundaries, uh, essentially um, stuff that I'm covering in the first lecture. And here's the cover of my book that I gave a little more mathematical uh, justification and uh, discussion to uh, help uh, Christopher's arguments. So I promised that I'm going to relate this to the golden mean. Uh, if, if you remember that in the uh, universal uh, scaling sequence, the ratio of the terms tends to this, uh, tends to this number 2.618. Well, 2.618 happens to be the square of the golden mean phi. Golden mean, of course, is 1.618. And you have phi squared equals phi plus 1. That's how we get 2.618. So this is an interesting coincidence. but. I want to emphasize that this has nothing to do with the proportions of rectangles. The most popular golden rectangle is the credit card. Well, that has nothing to do with um, universal scaling. It's just a rectangle. Uh, many people um, are um, amazed at the application of the golden mean to the Parthenon, but I'm not, because when you, when you draw the golden mean in front of the Parthenon, you also include the triangular pediment. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a triangle that's obvious uh, uh, that is a golden mean. You have to draw something in space. Anyway, uh, traditional applications of the golden mean are to rectangles. And here I'm not talking anything about rectangles. I'm talking about ratios between, between dimensions on the same, in the same direction. Now, we come to the, to the uh, um, uh, focal point of, of this lecture. Which, architects, which architectures obey universal scaling? Well, it turns out that all traditional architectures obey universal scaling to some form. Gothic architecture, classical Western architecture, the Greco-Roman tradition, Islamic architecture in its many manifestations throughout the world, uh, vernacular architectures used all over the world, and traditional architectures from all cultures and all periods. There are two exceptions. One is international modernism, and the exception I think uh, can be traced to what I uh, mentioned earlier, this uh, tremendous freedom from material constraints that we obtain with, uh, with uh, very uh, hard and, and durable materials. And uh, the other one, um, the other exception goes through throughout all of history, that is military, defensive military architecture that uh, is meant to keep people out. So there is no need to, to have subdivisions. You want to... Uh, to have a hostile appearance. So that does not obey universal scaling. Here, is, uh, here are just a few examples. Uh, this is the Majid Shah Isfahan, the great, uh, the great um, entrance. And uh, we can see that the, 
the, uh, the main arch has a ratio to the uh, secondary arches on either side, which is approximately what, uh, what we propose, uh, 2.7. Well, this is about 2.5. Uh, the, the width of the, of the main arch compared to the uh, width of its boundary. That's an important uh, point that I will discuss later, the boundary of, uh, of something. Another example from Islamic architecture, a window from the Alhambra in Granada, Spain, uh, the width of uh, the entire window compared to the width of the um, of the subsidiary window is not exactly half. It's it's a uh, it's closer to 2.75, which is uh, the number we want. So this is the actual uh, the actual space. And why does this occur? Well, because there is extra extra material here, and uh, we can continue actually to measure these, these pieces and come up with interesting relationships and, uh, and uh, more terms of the universal uh, scaling sequence. Uh, and my, friend, um, uh, my friends who are architects <coughs> told me that at this stage I should just abandon, uh, in this particular uh, talk, uh, I should abandon uh, talking about um, uh, numbers and text and just show uh, pictures where universal scaling is found. But um, I have decided uh, for aesthetic reasons just to uh, show uh, sketches that I make myself. So uh, I really don't want to make uh, hundreds of, of different sketches by hand in order to illustrate uh, these lectures. Uh, and anyway, I, I will have to, to go and, and, uh, and uh, either visit places uh, myself with a tape measure or find uh, sufficiently sharp photos from, from a good perspective in order to do these measurements. And uh, I have other things to do. Well, I have to prepare the rest of the lectures of this series. So uh, it's, uh, I'm not the one to do the, the measurements. However, uh, I, um, uh, let me see. Uh, yes, I, I call forth on interested students to, uh, to uh, look at traditional architectures uh, of all different cultures in all different periods, and to do some measurements and see if they find uh, the universal scaling uh, and to what degree they find it or if they don't find it. And uh, that's, that should be an interesting, um, in, interesting uh, uh, set of exercises because I have, I'm, I'm giving out a challenge, and, and the challenge is the following. It's not that a few select buildings obey universal scaling. The challenge is the following, is that most, if not all, buildings of most, if not all, mode of universal scaling. So uh, there's an enormous amount of work to be done in, in checking this. And um, as I said, I'm not the one to do it. I have given the idea. OK, uh, let's go back. How do we validate this, uh, these ideas, or if you don't believe their ideas, conjectures? How do we validate them? Well, uh, here is the argument, and I want to, to uh, express the, the points of the argument. Uh, human beings evolved uh, into uh, different uh, societies, different cultures, uh, different areas of, of, the, of the world. Um, influenced by the, the climate. And uh, uh, it is my claim, and uh, not only mine, but uh, my circle of friends who are architects, uh, that uh, indigenous architectures have evolved universal scaling. And not only in the monumental architecture, but in the vernacular architecture, in the houses, in the everyday, everyday um, um, habitations, um, uh, in everything. If this is true as we claim it is, then universal scaling is innate to human beings, not to a particular culture. If something is innate to human beings, then it's extremely important. Now, as I said, we have to discount the obvious exceptions, like the pyramids and military fortifications. The pyramids had to appear unapproachable because 
the body of the pharaoh lay in the middle, and we didn't want, you don't want anyone to disturb the body of the pharaoh. So the pyramid is a shape that psychologically tells you, keep away. It's not an inviting shape. Whether uh, anyone in the audience wish to discuss the psychological impact of the pyramid, the glass pyramid in the Louvre, that's a good uh, topic for discussion, <laughs> but I'm not going to do it in this particular lecture. Nevertheless, um, I'm looking for innate reasons to uh, apply to uh, to apply universal scaling to architecture. Uh, let's look at a major typology of the 20th century: the skyscraper. The one on the left is the skyscraper we build today. The one on the right is the representative of the early skyscrapers of the turn of the 20th century, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, uh, up into the 1920s, and that's, that's about it. After 1920s, uh, we had uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe uh, give the very simplistic minimalist design for the skyscrapers and most skyscrapers adopted that with very few minor variations uh, in recent years. Uh, I think um, that many people agree with me that the early skyscrapers have a certain charm. Now for a large building with enormous amount of stories to possess a certain charm, that's quite an achievement. And I claim that the charm comes from uh, the subdivisions. Um, namely the uh, universal scaling. Uh, you can see in the skyscrapers of uh, Louis Sullivan and other early skyscrapers. Well, there is no scaling in the monolithic skyscraper because that's defined on a single scale. The vertical scale, say, even in the horizontal scale, when we look at the horizontal uh, dimension, there could be some articulations, but those articulations are, say, another scale. So where uh, the, the viewer looking at this from a distance and approaching the skyscraper expects 20 different scales to be evident, they see just two, the actual width of the skyscraper and some articulation. And um, minimalist skyscrapers even try to get rid of that second articulation, so there's, there's nothing left. So uh, this, uh, this discussion uncovers something else. Not only uh, not using the universal scaling, but a deliberate avoidance of the universal scaling for a certain aesthetic effect. Let's look at an application to house facades. Here are two houses, uh, res residences of approximately the same size and shape. They happen to be, the overall facade happens to uh, be, be quite close to, uh, to the uh, a golden uh, rectangle, but that does not concern us here. What concerns us is the um, is the um, satisfaction of universal scaling. Well, the one on the left does not have universal scaling. It has one or two subdivisions, but that's it. The one on the right has subdivisions. It is an Art Deco uh, building that has uh, subdivisions. If we ask ourselves what, which um, of these uh, two houses we like better, it's, not, it's a very bad question because that tells us uh, preferences, aesthetic preferences, which are usually learned and have uh, associations with uh, how we grew up, what, what culture we are in. Um, nevertheless, um, the one on the right with the subdivisions uh, I think gives a better physiological response. What I just drew in order to make the comparison between the two residences was a shape seen only on the larger scales. But as I keep uh, emphasizing throughout um, this lecture, it is on the smaller scales that the difference is really dramatic. In the modernist house, which was shown on the left, there are no smaller scales, and thus there is no scaling hierarchy. 
one or two terms and that's it. So to see that, I have shown here the two buildings again and I have magnified the piece of, uh, of each building. And you see, I magnify a piece of the building on the left and this blank, there's nothing. I magnify a piece of the building on the right and there is substructure, articulation. It is there. And I can keep magnifying until I get down to very, very small details. Uh, and we have substructure. Well, this is the essence of the universal scaling, that there is substructure all the way down in scales as you go. Now, at this point, I expect the following question to arise, and I have the answer ready. Yes, it is true that I have picked on the building on the right, on the building on the right, I have picked a point where there is substructure. But there is also, there are also uh, regions of the building on the right that there are, it, it's quite smooth, there is no substructure. Well, the, the scaling uh, hierarchy does not mean that everything is covered in detail. It means that there is a region or a few regions where detail gets focused. The, the um, articulation becomes more intense you get smaller and smaller subdivisions. If you do it everywhere, then it becomes too much. And, of course, some architectures uh, do subdivision everywhere. Uh, others have sub, uh, subdivisions in, in focal points, and, and uh, the architect decides where to have more and more detail. And, and that's what I'm referring to. So this is not a, a dishonest uh, choosing of, uh, of a region that has a particular detail, it is part of the, of the universal scaling that there are regions, and those regions are carefully selected. Well, I can tell you now, where are those regions? Those regions are where the user will experience them to better effect. So you see, the, the, the detail I show uh, is around the doorway. Well, this is the most uh, frequently um, uh, visited uh, area of the building. If you have such detail close to the roof, it is less effective and it probably uh, will, be, will be wasted. Now, I wish to discuss um, another application of, uh, of the universal scaling uh, sequence, and that is the wide boundaries of, uh, of an element. An articulation needs its edge defined so in order for this to be commensurate with universal scaling, an edge or a center should have a lip, a thickening, a, a uh, definable uh, boundary. And I don't mean a line, I mean a thick boundary. So this, this concept, of course, um, uh, will give us a wide door or window frames. It gives us baseboards, pilasters. Uh, all elements of traditional architecture uh, all over the world uh, and, and those elements are precisely the ones that were removed when, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, there was a movement to show off the strength of industrial materials. Namely, we don't need a beam over the door because we can uh, create something out of very strong materials. So, uh, the same thing for the window. We can have a sheer edge coming to, uh, uh, to the window. Well, people are building this way today without realizing, realizing that there was a psychological statement to having uh, windows without frames and doors without, uh, without frames. And uh, I'm trying to get back to the uh, positive response that one gets by uh, using a door with a wide frame. Here's a nice medieval door, Western medieval door, where the frame is, uh, is defined by, uh, by elements, architectural elements, and uh, it is so wide that we, get, uh, we satisfy the universal scaling. Here, uh, the, the uh, window in the middle is rather minimalistic, but it acts as a frame of the other uh, structure so that w we see the ratios of um, the, the larger length to the smaller length is, is, uh, is uh, consistent with our universal scaling. And um, the, the centering of, of this window um, gives a certain balance and, and symmetry. Incidentally, 
uh, this is not a modernist window. This is uh, uh, from Islamic architecture, 14th century. Uh, there, is, there is a balance and a coherence um, to this because of uh, such scaling, even though there, uh, there is no more uh, detail here. So a summary of what we have done before uh, I go into something else uh, totally new. I want to use the ratio of lengths to aid design and to introduce a change of thinking about proportion. Proportion has been identified as the ratio of the size of the, of the rectangle. Well, that's not what I mean. Instead, I want to uh, compare the dimensions of objects measured along the same direction. So these are the ratios of, of objects that I can measure along the same direction. So either vertical, horizontal, along the three dimensions, actually. We have the, the three uh, uh, x, y, and z directions, and we can apply the universal scaling to all three di directions. And there's nothing magical or mystical about this. Uh, as there is a cloud of mysticism associated with a golden section. And of course, as a scientist and mathematician, I don't buy uh, any of that. And uh, uh, OK, to, uh, to move on to something totally different, but which turns out to be essentially important, biophilia. What is biophilia? Well, one of our uh, greatest living uh, biologists, Edward Wilson, has introduced a term to describe an innate connection between all living beings. And specifically, human beings have a biologically founded link to other life forms. This connection is genetic. It resides in the common parts of our DNA. Now, let's look at how the human body evolved. The human body evolved to respond to the natural geometries, which uh, I have, uh, uh, not only I, uh, we know to be fractal, the certain colors, the certain scaling, the universal scaling, there are symmetries. These are the natural forms. Well, over several million years, humans develop an extremely accurate sensory system. And how was this sensory system developed? Well, by evolutionary processes to help us to deal with the uh, natural environment. So our system is fine-tuned to perceive positive aspects, food, friends, and mates, and also threats. Tiger is about to pounce on you, or other threats. So we have um, this tuning that, uh, well, not only tuning, we have the entire development of the human sensory system that we use to experience architecture, and it is fine-tuned to certain natural geometries. The fine-tuning includes uh, the detection of pathologies of our body, and that is also signaled by the departure from natural geometries. Um, I can think of, of, of a host of, of things to say. Let's see, heartbeats. Heartbeats have a certain fractal structure. Uh, as um, I'm not going to include that in the talk, but there was a pioneering study done by uh, Bruce West uh, showing that when a pathology of the heart sets in, the heartbeat changes its fractal structure in a way that it becomes non fractal. Now, this is an extraordinary thing, and uh, uh, certainly uh, the individual who is having heart problems notices the heart beating in a different way. They, they, they cannot analyze their heartbeat to see if the fractal structure is there or not. But doctors now can, can do this analysis. And um, uh, here is a fractal structure in the temporal domain. I've been talking so far about fractal structure in, in the spatial domain. Um, plants, trees, uh, have a intrinsically fractal structure. So anyway, to, um, without getting off the, off the off track here, our sensory systems are, are built to detect these geometries. So we require constant contact with this type of geometry, the geometry of biological structures. And if we are deprived of contact, from contact with this geometry, specific geometry, then we get ill, or we are predisposed to getting ill. Well, 
the experiments have been done that show that uh, post-operative healing in hospital rooms that have positive biophilia are faster than uh, post-operative healing in uh, hospital rooms that have uh, no biophilia. And this is a remarkable uh, study done by Roger Ulrich uh, about 20 years ago, and um, that has spurred a, a whole um, uh, movement of uh, investigation now being done uh, in hospitals by, by doctors. Uh, not so much by architects. Most architects don't know about these, these fundamentally important uh, findings. So the, 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 the basic experiments are the following. Uh, you just uh, find in the same hospital exactly the same rooms, uh, some of which look out into real trees through a window, and the others which have no windows or look out into a blank wall. And you just measure the um, the conditions that patients uh, recover after the same type of surgery, and then you compare, and you see a, a remarkable, a, a, a significant percentage improvement when you are able to uh, to look at a tree. Now, different studies done in Japan rather recently show uh, a, a confirming effect, not in the time taken to heal, but in the amount of pain medication required. Patients that had um, uh, Yes, patients that had uh, a biophilic environment required less pain medication uh, during their post-operative healing than those that had a um, just a bland uh, industrial hospital-like environment. Uh, now, uh, uh, many hospitals in Europe have uh, are starting to utilize or have already started to utilize these findings by um, having very small but uh, plentiful and easy, easily accessible internal gardens. Um, and uh, in, in the rooms where, uh, where uh, patients are recovering uh, who cannot move from the room, they're mimicking uh, natural effects, either by bringing plants in or even a, a fairly detailed and realistic uh, uh, photo of a plant, which um, is not as good as a real plant, uh, because the real plants have other properties. But still, even with these, uh, with these uh, uh, um, uh, substitute biophilic effects are, st are still observable. And, and the light, uh, the quality of the light, um, hospitals are starting to employ new light fixtures that, that give a more natural uh, light that is, that is broken up. So um, we are experiencing a rediscovery of things that people intrinsically knew uh, that made them feel better. Being close to nature is more than an aesthetically positive experience. It is rejuvenating to your physiology. And uh, uh, there are studies that, that uh, show conclusively that social and mental health deteriorates in natureless surroundings. Okay, so we required healthy environments for, um, for our health. We want a positive emotional response that uh, reduces stress and raises resistance to disease. There are, there are two things that are, are, are playing simultaneously here. The uh, suppression of uh, environmental factors that raise our uh, distress, and uh, a certain emotional uh, regeneration, a positive feeling that comes from architecture. We know that we get some sort of emotional nourishment and regeneration inside a great building, or a, even a modest building that has special, special uh, uh, geometry a special geometry, and you, these buildings are usually uh, older historical buildings that have been um, found to have uh, these properties, and there's nothing magical about this. This is the geometry of the building. This is the essence of a successful architectural conception uh, realized in materials that gives us uh, regenerative feelings. The great religions of the world, it was their aim it was their aim to um, give this feeling to the, to the worshiper. 
when uh, the worshiper enters the house of God. You want to be regenerated. Well, can we create buildings today that gives this, give the same feeling of uh, regeneration? And uh, the answer is yes. There are architects today working in uh, traditional uh, typologies who use universal scaling intuitively. They have not learned it from me. They have developed it intuitively. They have learned it from the uh, traditional typologies. But the, the, very few people can get this kind of training today. They have to develop it on their own. Now, by traditional architects, I mean traditional um, uh, Shinto Japanese architects, traditional Chinese architects, traditional Islamic architecture in its many, many different, uh, uh, different uh, varieties, traditional Indian architecture in India, northern India, southern India, and not necessarily uh, Western classical. Uh, I am in contact with, uh, with my friends who are classical architects, and, and I find that I, I have very little to teach them because their training, they have a memory of classical architectural typologies, and that's enough to guide them to instinctively use universal scaling today. Now, what I'm trying to get at is to uh, work with design outside the traditional form language. So that's the problem today. Every architect wants to be innovative. They are reluctant to apply a traditional form language. So I would like to do the, the following two things. One is to validate each traditional form language that exists anywhere around the world to be used again today without uh, having uh, that architect condemned as being old fashioned. I think that's it's a horrible thing and it is totally destructive. The second is to help architects who want to reach out and start a new form language for themselves. Well, this, this series of talks will give uh, useful tools, I hope, that will help architects in uh, reaching uh, those goals. So uh, my, uh, my second uh, main goal is to give tools for design outside the traditional form language, tools that will enable an architect of today to develop their own uh, new form language. <laughs>